We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that you really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovics. Joining me today is Nick Giambruno. He's the founder of the Financial Underground Newsletter and the editor-in-chief of its premium investment research publication, The Contra Speculator. Thanks for joining me today, Nick. Hey, great to be with you, Tom. So, Nick, you recently wrote an article highlighting the idea that 2023 has a perfect storm of crises converging. So what is the most consequential part of this storm? And maybe why aren't most people really conscious of this issue? Uh, yeah, so uh, a lot to unpack here. So we'll t- start with the, the the really big picture view and kind of zoom in uh, from there. Um, yeah, the world is obviously going through many changes, geopolitical changes, financial changes, cultural changes, and these are all kind of converging at once. And uh, that has huge consequences, not just for financial markets, but uh, just life in general. So um, the kind of big picture thing is that the current U.S.-led world order is breaking down. And I know that's a loaded term, the the quote unquote world order. And, it it, you know, it's a weird thing. And people don't generally think of like, what is a world order? What is this thing? Like people don't know what this is. And they, they've heard like George H.W. Bush talk about it. They've heard a lot of globalists talk about it, about pushing their new world order. But the fact is, is that it's not a, you know necessarily a good thing. I'll explain what it is. It's very simple. It's just a way that the big powers of the world get together and have an organization and kind of divvy up uh, power among themselves. Uh, the world orders are nothing new. They've gone on forever, basically. Uh, the current world order is the result of World War II, where the U.S. is at the front of it, at the head of it. Um, so basically, think of it like this. Think of it, you know, you have a city and you have various crime families and mafias and, and street gangs in a city. And typically what they'll do is they'll divvy up the neighborhoods among themselves. And uh, it'll be kind of this informal agreement between crime families. Like this is your neighborhood. This is their neighborhood. And, you know, they that agree, that's the agreement. That's what a world order is basically <laughs> on a global basis. It's an agreement between the crime families that run the various uh, spheres of influence. That's what it is basically. Uh, So uh, what we have is, uh, you know, the world order is breaking down. So you have what we have now is the current world order came out of World War II, where the big powers made this uh, agreement. And it's kind of lasted, it's kind of morphed a little bit with the collapse of the Soviet Union, but more or less, it's been a US centric world order with China and Russia kind of having junior seats. They have seats at the table, but they're junior seats at the table. So the current world order is breaking down and We'll see what comes next. I mean, is it, it nobody knows what's going to come next. Is it going to be a reshuffling of the current world order? Maybe China and Russia get bigger seats at the table? Uh, or is it going to be a completely new world order where it's all just shaken up? Uh, we don't know. So, but what we do know is like when, you know, you look at a city, when these organ, these, this agreement between crime families breaks down, what usually happens is usually a power struggle a violent power struggle until a new agreement is reached. And I think we're reaching that phase in the world order now where the current agreement is breaking down and there's going to be a struggle. And God forbid it's a violent struggle between the big powers. That's going to be very nasty. But that's what we're looking at. Um, So that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is the financial situation is 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 terrible. Every basically every Western country is in the same predicament uh, where they have too much debt and they're addicted to money printing and uh, spending. Frankly, uh, I mean the spending is this the impetus for the debt, which is the impetus for the money printing. Uh, and I don't see any way around it. I think they're stuck in this um, uh, political, socio-political inflationary death spiral, frankly. And a good example of that is Argentina. Argentina, people who are 70 years older uh, or, or, or older in Argentina have lived through four hyperinflations. And it's the same crap every time. And they don't learn. That's the you know the thing is, is you think, oh, maybe they would learn after the third hyperinflation. They don't learn. Uh, basically, what it is, is, you know, the, the government... 
prints money to buy votes, hands it out to the plebs, uh, tries to gain power, and it collapses the currency. Um, it, it's the same thing. I mean, basically, more or less every country is Argentina, uh, just on a different uh, time horizon. Um, and that's the name of the game of democracy. When you have democracy plus money printer, it equals hyperinflation everywhere. I mean, it's it's not uh, hard to see how that works. Um, so I think that's what we're we're getting into the terminal stages here of that in the U.S., uh, North America, and in Western Europe. Uh, at the same time, we've got all these weird cultural changes uh, going on, these weird cultural agendas. Um, and uh, the countries are divided uh, more so. I mean, frankly, the difference between uh, Democrats and Republicans in the U.S. used to be like the difference between Coke and Pepsi, uh, John McCain uh, and uh, and Hillary Clinton. There's not much difference there. They're both warmongers who like to print a lot of money. Uh, now there actually is substantial difference, not necessarily in policy, but in culture. There is a real cultural divide, uh, even if the policies aren't that much different. They're culturally, that, that, that is real. There has become, there has emerged a real cultural divide. So you got all of these things kind of going on at the same time and, and reaching a crescendo at the same time. Um, and what is the in implication of this? I think uh, we're looking at the end stage of these fiat currencies, and that's going to have huge, huge, huge uh, implications, uh, not just for investors, but for, for everybody in the world. And uh, I think that's that's the big that's the big bottom line here is that the fiat currencies and the bond markets. You can just think of bonds as like long dated fiat currencies. All it is is a promise to pay fiat currency in the future. Bonds are an extension of the whole fiat system. There's no like gold backed bonds or anything like that. So they're all fiat instruments, and uh, we're reaching the end of the fiat era. So uh, that's going to have huge, huge, huge implications. Well, Nick, you know I appreciate the way that you really broke that down in into three pieces and even the the idea of breaking it down between you know the the two political parties that it's not necessarily a difference in policy but it's a difference in in culture um, mm -hmm. but i i'd like to stick with the the theme of inflation for now what mm -hmm. countries in the world are experiencing the highest inflation is is there a, a real theme to which countries are debasing their currencies at the fastest rates yeah i mean uh Look, you've got Lebanon, you've got Argentina, you've got uh, Zimbabwe, you've got Venezuela, Turkey. Uh, but the thing is, is that they're not that fundamentally different than, say, the euro, the dollar, the Canadian dollar, uh, the Japanese yen. They're not fundamentally that different. It's it's very, very similar. Um, the, di the only difference is the difference is, is um, you know, the relative size of these countries, not what they're doing. They're basically all doing the same thing and all the banking systems are all uh, you know, it, it structured in the same way. So I think it's it's an issue not of a country by country theme, which I think people get hung up on. It's a theme of the overall fiat currency. That's the problem. It's not an Argentina problem. It's not a Lebanon problem. It's a fiat currency problem. And I mean, this is this is I think the biggest distortion in in financial markets. And you know, I'm a speculator, and I like to look for distortions in the market. That's how speculators make money. Um, and I see the biggest distortion I see, and it's not just in markets; it's in all of basically human history. Is that most most of humanity doesn't know what good money is. They just thoughtlessly accept whatever the government gives them as money, and whatever this confetti, this crap, these pesos, these dollars. These these this, this garbage that uh, that governments can create out of thin air and then force through the threat of violence uh, their citizens to use that doesn't sound like a good thing. It sounds like economic slavery, frankly. So uh, most people are unaware of this and they just blindly use whatever money their government gives them, and that doesn't need to be the case. I mean, money is just a technology. Think of it. It's 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 a technology to. Uh, store value to to send value across time and space to store and exchange value. In other words, this does not need to come from the government. This is a completely ridiculous notion. Um, you know, it's like when you go back in time uh, to the Soviet Union and you ask people in the Soviet Union, "Where do cars come from? Where do shoes come from?" You know, they would say the government. Who else could make the cars? Who else could make the shoes? And you ask the average person today in the so-called uh, free countries, where does money come from? They're like, oh, the government makes money. 
And it, it's exactly the same mentality here. I mean, it's not that different. I mean, these people are basically just, uh, you know, non-thinking and don't maybe not non-thinking, but they don't understand. And they are non-thinking in this regard. So I think that's the biggest distortion. Yeah, there's a small uh, subset of people who understand hard money. But let's face it, these people are a rounding error of a rounding error of a rounding error. They're, they're not consequential. I mean, I, I obviously you guys uh, at Palisade are. I am. Uh, but that's not, you know, maybe one out of 100, maybe less than one out of 100 really are, are understand this stuff. So I think that's the biggest distortion in the market is that one people don't even know what money is don't know what good money is doesn't know what makes for a good money and they're using this fake money that certain people can create out of thin air and then use the threat of violence to force everybody to use i always liken it uh like this imagine you know if, if a mobster like a tony surprise i always like to try to distill things down to like a smaller level because it helps people understand like we were talking about the world order so forth but like with money money is not that hard uh, fiat money think of it like this think of like to a mobster like tony soprano he uh, had his own neighbor, you know, he's got his neighborhood and his goons kind of, you know, control the neighborhood. What if he forced everybody in his neighborhood to accept pieces of paper that has a signature on it as money? And if those who refused would be threatened with violence or uh, inflicted actual violence and kidnapping upon, uh, that's what... And then that, that's what would give that uh, money, fake money value. So people would be forced to use, at the threat of violence, Tony Soprano's signature as money. It's the same thing that's going on with fiat money. It's just people don't really uh, connect the dots. But it's exactly the same thing. So that's how I would think of the big picture uh, on money. Uh, and I think that's a huge distortion because money is not uh, is not an is not a creature of the state. It, it comes emerges on the market. Uh, that's where real. I mean, I always say fake money comes from government. Real money emerges on the market. So if you understand this and uh, you can position yourself like a speculator to take advantage of this distortion in the market, this is a huge distortion in the market. And money is half of every transaction that ever occurs, and, and most people don't understand what it is. So. Um, and nonetheless, that, that whole fiat system is is crumbling rapidly, as we've uh, you know discussed with what's changing with the world order, the built-in uh, spending uh, that these governments have, the debt. Uh, and just real quick, uh, to, sum, to, to just simplify the debt situation, they're at the point where they're going to have to print money to pay interest. That's when the rubber, that's when, that, that's the end of the line there. Uh, you know, that's that's game over. You know, they, they've uh, had this fiat system for, you know, all, almost, uh, I think, 50 years now. Uh, so around 50 years, yeah, more than 50 years since 1971. So uh, that's that's a long runway. But now they're at, they've never had the point where they've had to print money to pay interest rates. And I'm talking about the U.S. Now they are, are to pay in, the interest expense rather. They're getting to that point where the interest expense, the debt is so huge that the interest expense is going to become the largest item in the budget, bigger than Social Security, bigger than the the, the uh, Department of Defense uh, and interest rate. Excuse me, interest expense. So they're going to have to print money to pay the interest expense. That's historically the end game. That's you know. So I think we're running that. That that really is the indication that the fiat system is is at the end of the line. And I think even the elites know this. I, well, actually, I don't like to call them elites. They're not elites. They're not like elite athletes like Michael Jordan or anything like that. They're really parasites. So don't call them elites. Call them parasites. They're really they they understand this. Uh, that's why there's all this talk about the Great Reset. They know the system's going to collapse, and they want to try to shape it uh, into into a new system. So, a lot to unpack here, but that's kind of the uh, big picture view of of uh, what what we're facing here. You know, Nick, as as we're as we're talking about these different countries, like like you brought up the example of Argentina dealing with these hyperinflations, it it really you know strikes me that that most of these Western politicians, let's say, to, to use a broad term, really don't consider these second and third order effects of, you know, the types of programs that they promise their citizens to, to ultimately buy votes. I was reading an article the other day that the UK is going to help, help start paying its citizens to help with their inflation expenses. And, you know, this, this ultimately you know, seems to me that this is only going to exacerbate the inflation prob problem and the and the currency devaluation problem. So, why is this even being discussed? Is it because, you know, these these Western politicians only see the problem and time frame right in front of them and not what what ends up being the other consequences of these types of actions? Oh, I think that's absolutely part of it. I mean, politicians are. Um 
uh, wired, hardwired to do the most expedient thing. They don't think in the long term. They just think in the immediate term. So I think that is part of it. But I also think part of it is, you know, politicians are just people, too. And they don't understand money either. I mean, how many politicians understand money? Very, very, very few. I can probably count them on my hand how many really understand it. So I think that's a, co a combination of the two, of ignorance and expedience. And that's what, what you get these ridiculous policies. It's, it's, it's yes, let's solve the problem of inflation by creating more inflation is, is effectively what they're saying. I mean, this is, uh, you know, what they call the clown world. This is just insane. It's upside down. Uh, but it's an indication. This is not the kind of stuff that happens at the top of a civilization uh, or, or the top of a civilizational cycle. This is the kind of stuff that happens as things are starting to fall apart. And it's important to recognize, you know, take a step back and kind of look at where nations are, where civilizations are in this kind of, uh, in their life cycle. And I think this is an indication that it, it, things are about to get much worse. Do you think that this is, you know, that example is the beginning of a road of starting to force people to use a, a central bank digital currency? Well, I think that is what these people would like. The globalist uh, control freaks, they would absolutely like a, a, a CBDC. But um, I'm not, frankly, too worried about a CBDC because I think it's an, a move of desperation. It's kind of like a Hail Mary uh, that they're doing out of they, – they see this whole thing is collapsing – Power is slipping from their fingers, and this is kind of like a Hail Mary desperate last move to try to keep uh, the plebs uh, locked into this terrible uh, system that they have. And I don't think they're viable. You know, CBDCs are not really that new. Do you remember the first CBDC was in Venezuela? It was called the Petro. Did that save the Venezuelan uh, Bolivar? <laughs> did, did the did the Venezuelan people uh, were they were they forced to use the petro? Of course not. They were they found workarounds. In this case, it was the U.S. dollar, Bitcoin, gold, and other things. Um, so I suspect that's going to be the same thing here. CBDCs, yes, they sound very scary at, uh, in theory, and they are scary in theory, but they're not practical because if you think we have a lot of currency debasement now, just wait until they're completely unhindered. Uh, you know, the, 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 this makes currency debasement even easier. So um, that that is going to force people to look at alternatives, sound alternatives to these uh, terrible uh, fiat currencies. So I view it as a, a desperate Hail Mary. I don't think they're going to stick. I mean, they might be around for a little bit, but I, it, it, it's going to ultimately be self-destructive. Uh, They'll self-destruct, which is the good news. I mean, that's that's great. I hope CBDC self-destruct. This is a, an, a horrible thing that uh, these people would try to inflict upon. It's, 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 um, it's repugnant to anybody who values... Uh, individual sovereignty, financial sovereignty. It's basically enslavement. They, they want to enslave people. Uh, so yes, I hope it fails. I know it will cause a lot of pain, but it's it, that that is better than uh, roping everybody into this terrible system, which I don't think is, and I, I don't think it's viable for, for the reasons I said. We've also seen, it's not just Venezuela. Nigeria, Nigeria is another country that has introduced uh, CBDCs. This, let me just take a step back. This is what these kind of globalist uh, folks, they like to do. They like to find uh, obscure countries to use as a test, testing case, like a Petri dish. Uh, so they've, uh, didn't, they didn't necessarily do Venezuela, but they definitely did the Nigeria. They were involved in the Nigerian uh, CBDC. And that was a complete and utter failure. It has it had like a less than a um, half of a percent adoption rate, which means like one out of every 200 people used it. And that was after the government said, oh, you know, we'll give you special incentives. You'll, you'll get discounts if you use the, the CBDC. And the Nigerians still rejected it. They went to uh, other currencies. They went to Bitcoin. Uh, so that was that, that. That's actually an encouraging development because where they actually did try to do force a CBDC down people's throats, it was completely rejected. Completely rejected. So I, I don't think that the West. Yes, maybe certain cases there will be more success, but I think as a concept, I don't think CBDCs are viable. And just like I don't, I don't think fiat currency is viable over the long term. Uh, CBDCs are even less viable. You know, Nick, in that example, though, do you think that that might be a cultural difference with with the Nigerians already understanding inflation, hyperinflation, that they're averse to using a currency like that and they're choosing those other options because they've seen this road before? That is possible. And if that's the case, if other people like Americans or Swedes or Europeans if they're not familiar with it, they will become very familiar with it very soon. So the sooner you learn this lesson, the better. Better to learn it the easy way than the hard way. Mm -hmm. So Nick, you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, 
realistically currency debasement here. And obviously, mm-hmm. CPI is one of the measures of inflation, the, let's say the government measures of inflation. How should we be measuring inflation? And should we you know, even, even entertain CPI? No, I think you should put the CPI in the trash bin of history. It's it's basically government propaganda. Um, it's terrible. Um, it, in short, you know, the CPI. What is it? It's a basket of goods that the government cherry picks to create an outcome that they want. But let's just say that you actually could. Um, it, well, what, you could do this. It's it's, it's 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 a totally ridiculous concept because no, every individual has their own basket of goods. It's completely ridiculous to put this up across 330 million people. Uh, you know, somebody in Los Angeles has a different basket of goods than somebody in Nebraska, who has a different basket of goods than somebody in Florida, than, than somebody in Texas or Minnesota. So it's completely absurd to try to distill this down. So it, 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 it's a mission impossible. It's it's not, uh, not, you can't do this. This is just um, something. Uh, so what they try to do then is, uh, even even though they do do it, uh, they then they get to cherry pick what's included in it. So they obviously take things out that show higher price increases. So it's a completely manipulated statistic. It's it's laughable. Nobody should take this seriously. Um, in Argentina, nobody takes the government inflation numbers seriously. Uh, they they discard them and regard them as uh, government propaganda, which it is. Uh, so um, well, another thing Argentina did that I think we'll see in Western uh, other Western countries is they made it a crime to publish uh, uh, inflation statistics that differed from the government inflation statistics, called it misinformation. Uh, and it was actually a punishable crime. If you were a newspaper and you, you had your ind- an independent calculation of what in- the inflation was, you could go to jail or you could be fined. I think you can definitely expect this kind of stuff. Uh, to come to the U.S. and and Western Europe under the guise of fighting disinformation and and, and so forth. So that's that's coming. So what do you look at? I mean, uh, inflation. This is actually a, uh, an interesting uh, term because it's changed. Uh, the original meaning of inflation is an increase in the money supply. That's what it had meant since the beginning of economics until about uh, sometime in the early, mid 2000s. That's what if you looked it up the dictionary, looked it up in Webster's dictionary. That's what the, that's what it would tell you, and that is. That that makes sense. You're inflating the supply. Like think of like inflating a balloon. That's that's what you're doing. That's what the word is describing. So what these uh, terrible people in government and and their their uh, their buddies in academia and media they redefine the word. They're they're wordsmiths. They're propagandists. So they said instead of it, it being an increase in the money supply, we're going to make it a change in the in the CPI. That's what inflation is. That's not the definition of inflation. Um, but that's what everybody. That's what everybody says. That's what the media says. That's what the, the colleges say. That's what all the respectable people say. But it's wrong. This is a, a, a totally wrong notion that everybody just mindlessly parrots. The CPI does not equal inflation. The CPI is a meaningless, a manipulated statistic uh, that is basically government propaganda. If you want to know what the real inflation rate is, look at the change in the money supply. That will give you a much more accurate measure, uh, reading of what is actually going on. Nick, another kind of topic I'd like to touch on that really surrounds this whole idea of how much debt there is, is a, is a debt jubilee. So, you know, considering the levels of debt in the world, it seems, you know, almost like a reasonable idea. Would this help everyone that carries debt or does it just re- redistribute the wealth? Yeah, well, it sounds like a fun thing, you know, a good thing, you know, oh, a debt jubilee, you know, everybody's uh Slate is wiped clean. And this is a thing, uh, you know, from ancient civilizations and in ancient uh, religions. It's codified in ancient religions. Um, And I think it's a concept that's going to make a big comeback because the debts are unsustainable. They're going to have to be dealt with one way or another and defaulted in one way or another. They're, they're mathematically the math is is uh, you know uh, it's obvious it's it's not controversial. Uh, you look at the math the situation th- these debts can't be repaid. They can't be repaid. They can only be repaid for by debasing the currency, and that is a default. By the way, you can't pay if if, if you were to do that, that would be considered uh, fraudulent and definitely a default. But when the government does it, it's oh you know it's a it's a, a realistic option to deal with debt. Uh, but no, it's a default. It's absolutely it's a default by uh, defrauding the uh, the people who bought that debt. Uh, nonetheless, it's it's going to happen. Um, we've already kind of seen the first inklings of it. Um, 
we had, uh, you know, Biden try to relieve uh, to to do a student debt loan jubilee, basically wipe the slate clean. But you got to remember, debt doesn't exist in a vacuum. Debt there is a uh, there is a, on the other side of the debt is the lender. Somebody lent that money. That debt didn't just come out of nowhere. So really, what uh, the debt jubilees are going to be. I think it's going to happen through currency debasement. That's the only way to deal with this debt. I, I think it is because I don't think they're going to. I don't think the U.S. government is going to explicitly default. If you have the money printer, you never explicitly default. So, like when Argentina defaults, uh, they default on dollar-denominated debt because they don't have a dollar money. They don't have. They can't print dollars. And why do they have dollar-denominated debt? Because nobody will loan them money in pesos because they know the peso is going to get debased. So they can't. There's not even. There's no other side to that equation for debt in Argentine pesos because nobody is dumb enough to loan money in pesos. Um, so the same. Th so with the U.S., they have the do the world's reserve currency for now, so they can accumulate a lot of dollar-denominated debt, which they can of course print. Um, but they've reached the point where they're just printing money to basically pay for the interest rate, to, to the interest expense. Excuse me. So they that that is a uh, default through currency debasement, and I think that's exactly what's going to happen. Um, and that's not just so. Like I was saying before, too, the debt doesn't exist in a vacuum. There's the lender who considers that debt a bond, an asset. So I think bondholders are just going to get wiped out. Uh, bondholders, anybody holding an unsecured liability of any kind is in danger in this era of, of uh, debt jubilees and debt repudiation. You don't want to you don't want to be holding the bag. And these are the people who are going to be holding the bag who have um, uh, un unsecured liabilities and uh, bank accounts are an unsecured liability, too. So when it, but mo this is another thing most people don't understand is that when you put money into a bank, that's not your asset. You actually legally don't own it. Legally speaking, that money is not your money. It's not your money. And also, it's not even there because they've loaned it out with fractional reserve banking 10 times over. Um, and uh, so, you know, that you, that in the era of debt jubilees, where these um, debt is unsustainable and liabilities are getting wiped out, bank deposits are a huge liability that, you know, most people don't even realize they're a liability, uh, but they are. So I would include that in the whole uh, debt jubilee conversation um, because that is... Uh, going to hurt a lot of average people. I've seen this happen in many countries, in Lebanon, Argentina, and countless others, where uh, people just kind of mindlessly put money in the bank, didn't think anything of it, and then they get wiped out in a financial crisis. And I think uh, that is coming uh, to a theater near you if you live in, in the West. So Nick, what do we do about it? Is it best to store you know, value outside of paper or electronic instruments? Is it is it best to have tangible assets like Give us some ideas on how to get around this or, or hopefully mitigate some of these issues. Sure. Well, you know, we were talking about money and what is money and the nature of money. Money, again, is just a technology to store and exchange value. Find what best stores and exchanges value for you and put your uh, economic energy into that. That's what I would recommend. So uh, it doesn't need to be government currencies. It doesn't need to be bank accounts. Historically, gold has been the best store of value because it's been the one commodity that is most resistant to debasement. Uh, it is, and that's what has made it as an excellent store of value. So uh, physical gold, I would not want to have uh, any kind of gold IOU because that's just a, you're just holding a liability of somebody else. You don't want that, especially in these debt jubilees where IOUs are going to get wiped out in all kinds. So I want I want the unencumbered asset. Uh, so gold is a good choice. People use, real, like in Argentina and other countries, people use real estate as a, a store of value. It's not an ideal store of value. It's not the greatest, but it certainly is better than the peso. It certainly is better than the Lebanese lira. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I would have some exposure to real estate. I'd put Bitcoin in that category too. It's the same kind of uh, concept here. So look at those things um, because the, the currency debasement is going to make saving impossible. Uh, and it already is impossible for a lot of people around the world uh, but it's going to become impossible for uh, people in the West, uh, I think, very soon. So they're going to have to look at alternative savings vehicles. Forget about bonds. Forget about bank 
bank accounts. I mean, you, uh, as a practical matter, you do it. Everybody really kind of needs a bank account. Uh, but I, I, you know, I would be very wary of putting more money in the bank uh, than you need for spending, you know, monthly spending purposes and so forth. I wouldn't use a bank account as a long-term savings vehicle. That that doesn't seem like a good idea to me. Uh, so yeah, you got to consider the alternatives. And I think those are the top three, gold, Bitcoin, and real estate. How do you look at diversifying into other countries? Are there other other governments that show that they want to treat capital better than others? Uh, few and far between, sadly. Uh, most uh, politicians in most countries uh, are just looking to take as much as they can, frankly. There's very few. I mean, obviously, there are places like the Cayman Islands, uh, Singapore to a degree, uh, the United Arab Emirates, Dubai, these kind of stand out. But uh, right now, the sad thing is, is that, you know, this stuff can change very quickly. You know, a new government can have a new policy. But, you know, those those three have been generally a good, uh, they, they've respected property rights and respected wealth for a long time. So I don't see any immediate uh, change in any of those places. Um, but frankly, it's, it's, you know, you can't depend on politicians. You, this is something you, people have got to take responsibility for themselves to secure their own wealth and secure their own assets. You really shouldn't be depending on, um, politicians to do that for you in any regard. Yes. You don't want to be under the, the, uh, the writ of rapacious, uh, of rapacious politicians that are just looking to squeeze you. Um, so yeah, it's, it's tricky. And the thing is, is that it's a constantly ch uh, moving target. So, um, you want to have assets, those hard assets. What I mean by hard assets, we were talking about before, I think this is a, an important concept. I mean, it means it doesn't necessarily mean uh, tangible or physical. It means hard to produce. You want hard to, you want to hold something that somebody else can't make easily. That's what you want. You don't want to put your life savings into something that, you know, somebody can create on a whim. That's a terrible idea because basically you're just donating your wealth to the guy that can make it easy. So you don't want to do that. Uh, and you want to look, yeah, yeah, you want to have, you want to have international diversification too, but that is a constantly moving target. Uh, those, th those are, th those are some good countries that respect wealth, respect pro uh, property rights, but you also want to be nimble because the situation constantly changes. And with, with us, uh, you know, with the world going into, um, uh, a precarious situation with the world order potentially uh, breaking down and something new coming in its place, you absolutely want to be uh, nimble and flexible because it's nobody knows what's going to happen. It's And it's going to be chaotic, and you want to be able to move quickly. So uh, that's kind of the advice I would give with regards to that. Nick, you know, when we're, when we're thinking about the idea of these, these hard assets, as, as you brought up here, th there's a lot of debate, let's say, between Bitcoin versus gold. How do you see the differences and the let's say the how the 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 points stack up in each column versus or for for pros versus cons for each of those? Sure, I I am a big fan of both Bitcoin and gold. I like them both because I view them as alternative free market forms of money. Um, big, the gold is is an established uh, money. It's been around for thousands of years. People have used it as money for thousands of years because it is the one commodity most resistant to debasement. Um, I just want to make a quick point on, uh, about that because I think that is the most important attribute of money. There's no other attribute of money that is even second best at, in, in terms of that. If it doesn't have resistance to debasement, nothing else matters. Um, and how do you measure resistance to debasement? It's not necessarily scarcity. People think it's just scarcity. Oh, gold is, is scarce. And it is scarce, but it, that's not uh, hardness and resistance to debasement. It's related, but it's not quite the same. And I'll give you an example. Platinum and palladium, for example. There are fewer ounces of platinum and palladium in this world than there are ounces of gold. There's, they have more scarcity. They're, they're scarcer assets than, than uh, gold. So why aren't platinum and palladium better at money than gold? And the answer is simple. Because... Every year, the annual production of platinum and palladium is about equal to the current stockpiles, which means annual production, it, it, can, wild, it can wildly affect the market price of, the, uh, of platinum and palladium. That is absolutely not true of gold. The, mar the, the annual production of gold is like 1.4 or 1.5% of the overall gold supply, which means that the an new annual production is insignificant compared to the existing stockpiles. It's not going to really rock the market if 
there's a lot of gold produced relatively in one year or not. It absolutely will for platinum and palladium. So that makes gold a much better uh, store of value because it's not dependent on uh, it, it, it's not it's not held hostage to ever changing industrial conditions. It's not a very good attribute of a store of value. Because, so you want it to be neutral, and gold is neutral, the most neutral of any physical commodity. So it's important to put that out there because that I think illustrates the most important monetary uh, attribute. And Bitcoin also has that, and only Bitcoin does, in my view. The other cryptocurrencies don't because. It, it, Bitcoin is resistance to resistant to debasement, like gold is, uh, in the sense that it, 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 the new supply is is me is not very meaningful compared to the overall supply. It's again very similar to gold. It's, it's maybe one point six percent per year, but that's going to get cut in half uh, next year. So it's going to be even less than gold. Uh, that's not true of any other cryptocurrency because. All the other cryptocurrencies, they can be changed. Somebody can get together and change it. Look at Ethereum. Ethereum is number two. Ethereum changes the developers of Ethereum and the insiders of Ethereum change its monetary policy about as much as the Federal Reserve does. <laughs> so it's not it's it has no credibility. It's it's its hardness, its resistance to debasement has no credibility because these guys can just get together and change it. Same, it's the same with every other cryptocurrency, except Bitcoin. There is nobody who can get together and change Bitcoin. So that's the one glaring thing I really want to put a, a very clear line, is, is that Bitcoin is different than all the other ones for that reason. Um, so I'm not really interested in the other ones, because they don't really have attractive monetary characteristics in the same way that Bitcoin does. Okay, so that is, uh, that is uh, you know, that kind of sums up that part of it. But what else? Um, really, uh, look, I love gold, but I have to say... Well, the only reason we have fiat currency today is because of gold, and that maybe sounds a little bit uh, counterintuitive. It's because governments the governments would have never been able to create the fiat system out of nothing and just say, hey, guys, we're going to use government paper as money. The only reason the fiat system worked is because they bootstrapped it off of the gold standard over many decades. Uh, so why were they able to do that? One of the key drawbacks of gold is, unfortunately, its physicality. And, and it's it, that 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 makes it prone to centralization and capture, and that's kind of what happened. Um, so, so like you can't really like exchange gold with uh, people in other countries without having it centralized uh, through not necessarily central banks, but large institutions. So, if you want to you know trade with somebody in Europe or in or in China. Uh, because of, of gold's physicality, you kind of have to have it centralized into these parties. Maybe you don't necessarily need to, but governments uh, can't resist putting their claws on that because they, they want to tap into it, too. And that's kind of what led to the, the fiat system is that uh, initially governments had the monopoly over uh, international gold settlement. And then they said, you know what, why don't we just um, make promissory notes and, and instead of using the actual gold? Because sending gold from New York to Beijing or New York to London is very cumbersome. Why don't we just send gold receipts instead? Okay, then they started sending gold receipts. And then they're like, you know what? Why don't, we don't really want to use gold receipts. Why don't we just use, fee, you know, paper money? So that's how they bootstrapped the whole fiat system on top of gold. Uh, Bitcoin does not have that problem because it's not physical. So it is very easy to send. Uh, a, think about sending a billion dollars. If you want to send a billion dollars worth of gold from New York to London or Beijing, uh, you're going to have to charter. Uh, private plane, maybe uh, and, and more, I don't know how many jets you're going to need. It probably will take more than, than one uh, billion dollars worth of gold is a lot of gold. Uh, you're going to need armed security. You're also going to, you know, on the other end, the receiver is going to need to, uh, to test the purity of it. They're probably going to want to melt it down uh, and, and recast it. That's going to take some time. Uh, so look, I think, I think in terms of portability, uh, Bitcoin uh, win clearly wins there. Uh, in terms of established history, yes, gold uh, gold clearly wins there. That's the, it's it's over, you know been around for thousands of years. Bitcoin's been around for like fourteen so or so years. So um, I would look at it. They're both hard money. I both consider them hard money. Uh, I both I like them both. I think I think they will both do well as the fiat system uh, collapses. So right now, it's, you, you kind of have this three way world war. A financial world war. It's Bitcoin versus gold versus fiat money, and which maybe is going to morph into uh, CBDCs. Um, and I think Bitcoin and gold are both going to do very well as the fiat system collapses. Probably gold will do better, in, in my view, as the fiat system collapses, just because it's more familiar to people. People understand uh, gold much more than they understand Bitcoin. However, in the longer term, maybe in the next, you know, I'm, I'm talking, you know, after the fiat system has disintegrated, uh, in you know, ten years or or more, who knows how long it's going to take? But I'm saying in the more in, in the more immediate uh, uh, catalyst is that it's going to be good for gold. 
I think just because people are more familiar with gold, governments are more familiar with gold, it, it's going to do well. But, but I think over the long term, Bitcoin and gold will compete against each other and one will ultimately have to win. Uh, just because money, uh, the nature of money is that uh, money solves the problem of barter, which is the coincidence of wants. Uh, you know, if you, if you say, for example, you make apples and you want to buy a bicycle, uh, you, you, you're going to have to find a bicycle maker that also wants your apples. So that's what, you know, it's, it's not very likely that's the case. So if you converge on um, one money, because if you don't converge on one money, that's kind of you're going to be going back to some kind of like an inefficient barter system. So the nature of free market money is that one is selected, and uh, for that very reason, if you don't have one, you're all going to you're going to be more or less bartering. So I think in the long term, uh, gold and Bitcoin will compete. I think in the short term, they will both benefit because uh, right now the dominant mon money is fiat money, it, and and uh, as that blows up, uh, gold and Bitcoin will both benefit. And then uh, over the long term, they're going to have to compete on their on their monetary attributes. And I think that will be a very uh, interesting uh, uh, competition. I want to have exposure to both. I don't know which one is going to ultimately win. Uh, I think you could make a case uh, for both, frankly. Bitcoin has very interesting attributes. Um, so does gold. So I think, uh, you know, I want exposure to both. Over the long term, they're, they're going to compete against each other. I think Bitcoin has a shot at uh, overtaking gold over the very, very, very long term. Uh, but in the meantime, have exposure to both. Nick, do you think that they're, you know, with the idea of more regulation coming into the, the crypto and Bitcoin sector, that that brings more clarity and, and solidification of that as a, as a currency system? I think so. Uh, not that I'm a fan of regulation, but it's it's again we have to put a very clear line between Bitcoin and the other cryptocurrencies. And, and you know, frankly, this is one thing the U.S. government has actually got right is that they classify Bitcoin as a commodity, and all the other cryptocurrencies are potentially unregistered securities. I'm not a fan of securities laws. I think the SEC should have been abolished yesterday. I'm just talk. I'm just examining the situation from how. Uh, the world works today, not how I wish the world works, uh, which is a different uh, different story. But how the world works today is that there are securities laws. There is the SEC, and uh, it's it's very clear that these altcoins are are would fall under the category of unregistered securities, and Bitcoin doesn't for the very simple reason Bitcoin does not have an issuer. All these other altcoins have issuers. That's it. Case closed. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, there's there's the Howey test, of course, uh, that you can use that what they what the uh, SEC uses to determine a security. But the, the bottom line is, is that because Bitcoin is an asset without an issuer, much like gold, silver, corn, copper and any other commodity is an asset without an issuer. Uh, it, it is correctly classified as a commodity. And, and even the U.S. government recognizes that it's actually the only uh, cryptocurrency that has regulatory clarity on it. All the other ones don't have regulatory clarity. So uh, Bitcoin has already been clarified. Uh, I'm not too worried about that. I think it makes sense. I think even the people who are usually pretty, uh, you know, kind of dense on this stuff in the U.S. government, they understand it. And they, they actually, I, I think they, they uh, got this, this right. So I'm not too worried that it will be uh, changed. And let's just say it is changed. Let's say the U.S. government wakes up tomorrow and says, you know what, we were wrong. Bitcoin isn't a commodity. It's actually a security. Well, then all of that innovation and all of that wealth is just going to go somewhere else. It'll go to uh, China or Russia, probably Russia. Russia is way more open to uh, to to Bitcoin than China. China's banned it several times, uh, unsuccessfully, I might add. But they might have a change of heart if if they see that their rivals are are sh are shunning this uh, this new asset, this new international asset. They might open their doors to it. So I think that's where the game theory kicks in. If the U.S. is dumb enough to ban it, uh, they can ban it. Of course, I don't think it'll be practical. I don't think it'll work. But it'll be a golden opportunity for the U.S.'s rivals uh, to to really capitalize on this. So um, that's where I see it, and I think I actually think the U.S. government does to, does recognize this that if they ban it, they are just giving Russia and China a gift, basically. So I think they they're not that they're stupid, but they're not that stupid. Uh, but again, I don't know I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, but if it if 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 that does happen, that's what I, I think the next course of events will be. So. Um, it won't end it. It will just uh, move it to other locations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, that kind of brings up this idea that that you brought up earlier, the idea of, of financial censorship, right? We've seen that over the past couple of years in Canada, obviously. But I think this brings up the, the broader point of, of censorship in general, something that you and I spoke 
about before we hit record this morning. And I think something that, you know, is, is brought up a lot in the idea of having a CBDC as well. The, the idea of having this, you know, ultimate censorship tool where if the government doesn't like something that you said, they can, they can withhold your, your funds, whatever it is. So how do you see this, this wave of censorship, whether it's what you say, how you spend your money, you know, th- this just seems like something that is progressing incrementally against, against people that, that don't necessarily even understand that it's happening. Oh, I think it's absolutely despicable. Um, I mean, as a, as a general concept, um, censorship is abhorrent. If, if, if somebody is saying uh, something that's incorrect, the, the correct response is not to censor them. I mean, for, like I was telling you before, well, I, I, I'm not a socialist. I'm the furthest from a socialist. I, I'm an anarcho-capitalist. I, I don't like socialists. Do I think socialists should be censored? No, I don't think socialists should be censored. I think they should their ideas should be combated with better ideas, logic, and the truth. Uh, the idea that I, if I if I were in charge of Twitter or Facebook or YouTube, that I would like demonetize a socialist account or have them fired from their job or cancel their account, I, I find that absolutely disgusting. So I think um, I, I, you know I think that's how you should deal with these things. And as a as a general uh, notion, whenever you hear the mainstream media or the political class come up with a new term. You can almost be certain it's a propaganda term, you know, disinformation. This, what is disinformation? It's just something people don't like, information you don't like. This is ridiculous. Or hate speech. Uh, this, this, is, this is all just excuses for censorship. I think it should be uh, combated aggressively. Yeah, uh, from a philosophical standpoint, just because it's so repugnant. I mean, you know, you can't talk about things. You can't talk about, have a, an honest discussion about uh, the, the the climate hysteria. You can't have an honest discussion about COVID. Why not? What is this, North Korea? This is supposed to be the land of the free. I mean, yeah, that's a joke, obviously. It's not the land of the free, but it's supposed to be a nominally free country. You can't even have an honest discussion about something. So what if somebody says something you don't like? Or so what if somebody says something that's not right? Uh, you 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 counteract that with the facts. You counteract that with better ideas, uh, not censorship. So I find it I find it disgusting on many levels. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, if you're if you're basing your entire identity as a country around the idea of freedom, one would think that that would be you know upheld and and certain principles like that would be adhered to, not not constantly eroded. Certainly. And I think it's another aspect, you know, we're talking about uh, the big picture, what's going on with the big picture, uh, the geopolitical decline of the West, the financial decline of the West. And what goes hand in hand with that is cultural decline and um, uh, philosophical decline, ethical decline. Uh, it's all going. It's all going in a bad direction. Not for everybody, but you can certainly see it amongst uh, amongst the mainstream and what, uh, you know, what is considered the mainstream. So, um it's it's just another straw in the wind uh, for the for these trends that we've been talking about. It's not a good indication. It's a confirmation of the decline. Actually, uh, this is not the kind of stuff you see at the peak of the civilization. You don't you don't see this kind of um, uh, you don't see this kind of censorship and and cultural degeneracy. This is the stuff that you see w- with a civilization that's on its way down. Uh, and I think you know nobody knows when it's actually going to hit rock bottom. Or what's going to come next, but it's an indication of where things are going, and I think people should take note of that. Mm-hmm. Well, Nick, I think that's a good place to wrap up for today. Do you have anything else that you'd like to add before we do? Sure. No, it was great uh, speaking with you again, Tom. I think if uh, you know, there's a lot more that can be said on these issues, and I have a uh, special report on financialunderground.com. If folks want to go and check that out, uh, a lot more, including practical tips of, of uh, you know how to deal with uh, what is going on in the world today, you can check it out there at uh, financialunderground.com. Excellent. And of course, on Twitter at Nick GM Bruno as well, right? Yes. Perfect. Thanks so much for your time today, Nick. Hey, great to be with you. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.